Okay, today I'm in London with Matt Bisogno, who, amongst other things, is an owner, syndicate manager, owns ggs.co.uk, and is also the current chair of the Horse Race Betters Forum. Thanks very much uh, for agreeing to talk to me today, Matt. Um, right, getting straight into it, you're a very busy person, as, we, as I've just uh, said there. What is your background in racing, and was it always an ambition to make it a career? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for coming to talk to me, Simon. That's um, it's good. It's good to have an opportunity to go on on uh, on the record at Star Sports. There, um, my background is not really racing. None of my family have been into racing or betting, um, so it's kind of it's the the fire was stoked within me. Uh, I th I think I was about eighteen <clears throat> when I first went into a betting shop and um, put in a little bet on the football as you do, and then while you're working out your 2017 accumulator for a pound, um, there's this stuff going on in the background and there's this hieroglyphics on the wall and um, you get drawn in, don't you? And, and, and that was the start of it. Um, I came up to London <clears throat> 26 years ago now to do a degree uh, and I ended up working in the William Hill shops as a cashier first and then a seasonal betting manager seasonal uh, manager um, and then after I finished university I went to SIS I worked in a text room there for um, not a long time had a great time there quite a few of the lads that you might recognize on Twitter were in the text room at that time um, some good judges some loud voices um, didn't earn any money and then I went <coughs> went to do a proper job uh, working in banking I did that for about 10 years in software development project management for retail banks but always loved the racing in the background. And when I had enough of the, the banking, um, uh, I decided that I'd try to start my own little business and see how I got on. And that was about 12 years ago. So yeah, been doing it ever since then. And that was ggs.co.uk? Well, I first had a little blog called Nag Nag Nag, um, um, the home of racing ranting, great days. and. Um, <clears throat> that morphed into Gigi's about 10 years ago um, and Gigi's has changed actually so when it started out it was a little um, we used to um, I had a product called trainer track stats which was essentially trainer trainer statistics by course um, and the the Gigi site was a blog that supported that and then about five years ago in 2014 started I, I, um, I took the punt I licensed some data from Racing Post and um, we started to build um, the race cards and form tools that now make up Gigi's Gold. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, a, that's about four and a half years old now, that, that particular part of the site. And you've also enjoyed some success as an owner and syndicate manager? Mm. Yeah, some success. It's, um, it's a very up and down ride being... Um, <clears throat> Uh, owning parts of horses but yeah since 2001 uh, I got involved in racehorse syndicate ownership I had a horse called Love's Design with Julia Field in Newmarket and um, that lad won seven for us uh, Jason Weaver hard to believe he could do the weight he won he won four for us back in the day he was a cracking jockey um, very good pundit these days in fairness and um, yeah they were great days I've had had um, been involved in horses ever since right now we syndicate i think we've got eight at the moment we've got four with anthony honeyball uh two with ollie murphy and two up in the northeast with will story um so shares available in a couple of those if anybody's interested um, but mostly they're sold out and we're really they're, they're pretty much all jumpers so we're really looking forward to a, a cracking national hunt season Okay, most recently um, you came into the public eye with, you became the chair of the Horse Race Betters Forum. How did that come about? Um, well, the forum, uh, <clears throat> the forum itself was, was the brainchild, if you like, of Nick Rust and it's part of his strategy for growth in racing. Um, one of the pillars of growth is the betting pillar uh, and essentially trying to develop revenues in the sport. Um, and he, he recognised... Uh, coming from a bookmaking background himself as he does he recognized that um, there wasn't really a voice for the other side of the bookmaking contract um, and his he so HBF was his brainchild he contacted Simon Rowlands uh, initially to, uh, to be the uh, inaugural chair 
and then invited applications. I think they had over 100 applications. I was one of those. Um, <clears throat> surprised and pleased to get the call to uh, join the group and to, you know, to, to discuss the issues and, and try and make a positive difference um, to the betting landscape. Okay, before we move on to the HBF, uh, are you successful in your punting and has, um, have you been affected personally by the account restrictions? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, I, I have been successful with my punting um, and it's, it's um, success is, uh, is relative I think. So it, I think it's important to say that I, I'd call myself an aspirational recreational punter which is to say I bet for fun but I also have a profit expectation, um, so I bet to win as well. The two are not mutually exclusive, obviously. Um, and since 2012, I've made a profit every year, not fortunes, I have a day job and I can't live without that. Um, but, you know, a few quid from year to year. Um, I, I should caveat that by saying that last year I won about 50 quid and this year I'm losing. Um, um, not a huge amount, but um, I hope to turn it around. Uh, and part of the reason I think that that, that is the case is that um, I've been spending a lot of time doing uh, doing sideline projects like the Horse Racing Betters Forum. Right, moving on to the Horse Racing Betters Forum, uh, you've been involved since its inception in 2015, if I've done my research correctly. Yes. And it's gone from an idea to having a voice in Parliament and the Lords in rapid time. What do you attribute to its success? Um, I think there are a few there are, are there are a few factors. Um, I think the the fact that we've been um, that we were incepted by the BHA by Nick Rust essentially um, has given us gave us a bit of leverage with uh, racing stakeholders, the horsemen, the race courses, and obviously the regulator BHA themselves. Um, I also think that we spent. Um, HBF is a lobby group, and that means that we're our job is to ask other people to do stuff, to give us stuff, to give punters stuff. Um, we are always going to be um, perceived as a slight irritant um, because we are always asking people to concede ground to us. Um, I think one of the things that has led to some success on our part is that we've been quite fair-minded in the main about that, and I think we've... Uh, we fostered good relationships with people, not just in within racing, um, but outside of racing. As you, you mentioned, um, that we were involved in uh, a session at the House of Lords earlier in the year, um, and we had cross house, cross party support for the points that we were making there. We've also worked closely with the Gambling Commission, Information Commissioner's Office, uh, competition. Competition and Markets Authority, so external state regulators um, on various matters as well. And I think we've, the fact that we've tried to do that in an even-handed way, notwithstanding that we're, notwithstanding that we're all, always essentially, um, you know, in the punter's corner, I think that has stood us in good stead and enabled us to, um, to affect the changes that we have done so far. Uh, the more the more cynical people might say that punters have never actually had it so good. Such competition, fierce competition between the bookies. Why do they need their own body to protect them? Yeah, um, I think um, in my experience, most of the people who say that are bookmakers, um, and um, uh, so that, that that's a, that's kind of it's certainly a perspective. I, I I do have some sympathy with it in terms of concessions and the like, um, but I think. Um, from a from an HBF perspective and from a punter's body perspective, there are there are things like um, the state of uh, dispute resolution. You know, if a, if a punter has a dispute on a bet, um, the customer support teams at some of these large organisations are not always as helpful as they can be. There are things like terms and conditions, which um, which can be labyrinthine and. Um, exclusive of certain points that should be in there um, let's say they can be unfair um, there are things like uh, account verification procedures 
uh, for anti-money laundering and know your customer, which tend to happen at the point of withdrawal, not the point of deposit. There are things like problem gambling. There are a whole raft of things um, that affect the punter outside of the straight, you know, the standard bet contract that hitherto punters haven't really had a voice or somebody, uh, you know, kind of an ombudsman, which you'd get in other in other industry sectors uh, to support them uh, in the in in the fight against um, unfair practices. Uh, as a group, the HBF appear to have spent a lot of time championing the lot of a very small minority of punters, and that's the ones that win. Is this not concentrating on a group that can look after themselves and arguably, to borrow a phrase from Barney Curley, are takeout merchants and put nothing back into the game? Um, well, I, I probably touched on that that point in my last answer. Um, we are our remit is a lot broader than simply, and I think that's the implication of your question, the a minimum bet liability. Um, to to get to the the point of minimum bet liability, first of all, there are lots of people who are restricted who are not winning punters, just caught up in the algo dragnet, um, and I think you know that there aren't many people who who. Uh, would have a different view on that. Um, secondly, we've se we in HBF in our suggestions that minimum bet liability is one element of the charter um, that we're putting together and consulting on. Um, we've set the threshold for that at five hundred quid. Um, now in Victoria, in Victoria State in Australia, it's two thousand Aus dollars, which is about. 1150 quid I think um, we've set we've set it at a very low level and um, I don't think I don't think it it's set at a level that is kind of only uh, beneficial to professional punters um, it may not especially be beneficial to professional punters who may be looking to take out a good bit more than that um, and most of those pros have already got their ways and means of of, of getting on to the, the amount they want to um, so I don't actually think that the minimum bet liability that we are proposing um, helps the serious pros at all. Uh, the big bookies have sort of made a veiled threats that if they adhere to that, they'd be taking away the concessions, taking away Bob and all the things that most punters that don't win enjoy and gives them a bit of a chance. Do you think that's a bluff by them? Um, no, I, I think it probably, I think market forces dictate that um, any any bookmaker that takes away best odds guaranteed is going to suffer a, um, a backlash from that. Um, I can see the argument for a, for a separation between, let's call it a no frills account, where a punter has a right to bet to take out 500 quid, but doesn't have a right to get the best price guaranteed on that wager. So if I bet, if I bet a horse um, 50 quid at 10s and that horse goes off at 14s I get paid out at 10s and it, you know it's my it's my judgment against the bookmaker I personally wouldn't have a problem with that and I think that's where we go to with minimum bet liability so I don't I don't see BOG and MBL as being mutually exclusive um, but I do think that right to bet is more of a right than right to concessions um, if you see what I mean. So really, really what the ideal solution you were saying would be then is that the, the end restriction would be you don't get any bog, you don't get any concessions, but you can still back a horse to win uh, a sensible amount of money. That would be good for everybody. Yeah, well, I, I think, I, I think um, there are different kinds of punter. There are punters who bet £2 or £5. They're, never, they're, ne they're not trying to take out more than you know, 30 or 40 quid. Um, and they lose money slowly as a result of best odds guarantee. They're kept in the game longer. Um, how bookmakers deal with that is, is up to them. But I think removing their concessions would be um, probably short-sighted. Uh, and then there are other punters who, as I say, these aspirational recreationals, you know, they're not pro betters, but they are, they, they are trying to win. They are, they are comfortable with the fact that they're trying to win and that that's okay, actually. Um, and they should be allowed to get a reasonable bet on, notwithstanding the fact that they shouldn't necessarily be allowed to have all sorts of bells and whistle concessions at the same time. Um, I mean, quite apart from anything else, if, you're, if you can't get a fiver at three to one, 
um, with a bookmaker. It doesn't matter if you can get best odds guaranteed or not. No, absolutely. Um, finally, on this topic, at racehorse bookmakers used to have a, used to have to display a sign with a with an amount they would guarantee a horse to lose before they could do business. Could lobbying for a similar system be brought to bear for on course layers? Would that be feasible? Sorry, could you say the question again? Bookmakers on course used to have to display a sign to say they would guarantee to lay a horse to lose a certain amount of money to yeah. any punter. Yeah. Um, and that was that was a condition of their trading. Would that be a feasible thing to try and ask? You know, if, if the bookmaker won't take that bet, you can object to so, a licence? So or, you mean an off-course bookmaker yeah, or it, a remote to, to, operator? Along, um, any bookmaker that is taking bets online from people in England, would it be feasible to try and object to their licence? Or put a clause in that they would have to agree to X amount of money per punter as the racehorse bookies used to have to do. Right. I mean, I, I, I the, the short answer is yes. I think that's reasonable. Um, that's a personal opinion. Um, I think the reality is that the licensing uh, conditions and code of practice, uh, the gambling commission are not going to be especially vexed by this at this time. Um, so is it is it a realistic possibility? No. Um, in terms of a more general uh, term or condition that bookmakers should probably have in their, in their list of T's and C's, I think there should be a statement that says um, if, if a customer shows an aptitude for winning, they may, suffer, they may incur restrictions or closure, if that's going to be the case. Um, I, think, I think the fact that a punter can open an account um, in good faith expecting to try to win a few quid from their own uh, endeavours um, and, and then subsequently finding maybe you know oftentimes on a losing account and they've just happened to land on a shortener a couple of times um, <clears throat> that their account is restricted without any reference to that in the terms and conditions that doesn't seem right to me and I, and I really think that that's that's something that the commission probably should look at in their in their uh, review of fair terms and conditions currently. So, uh, so a reasonable time scale would be quite good. So I've I've had a purple patch before following a mate's tips, had my account closed, and I'm back to winner since. Mm. You know, but that's really quick that happens. Yeah, I'm sure people can find the other other people well, found that. I but. mean, I think that one of the things that HBF has done, and I, and actually I've personally done, is I've spoken with a couple of, um, in fact, a few. Uh, remote operators about this and they all recognize that the algorithm can be a little bit too um, too hasty in making a decision and that they're probably losing quite a lot of what they would term profitable customers uh, and I don't think that that's good for their business I don't think it's good for public perception I don't think there's any winners in that situation um, so one of the other things that we're lobbying for in our charter is a kind of a a feedback loop or a right to reply whereby if an account is restricted um, and a customer feels that it's unfair um, you know they've obviously got to articulate why they feel that then there is an opportunity to to have a get a second opinion if you like and one firm bet victor um, have have put that in place in their customer ser service um, provision and there's another uh, operator who are working to do that now I know there's I know there's a customer support overhead with that um, and I know that probably in a majority of cases they're still not going to reach agreement with the, um, the, the the customer but from a perception perspective and from a um, from the perspective of keeping open accounts that could be profitable for the bookmaker I think it's a really positive step forward and I'm glad that we've been able to um, to try and you know suggest that as something that bookmakers should look at. I mean, it may just be me being green, but I'm a bit shocked to find out that the trader's decision was an algorithm at the time. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, well, fine. I mean, you know, it's just I, like, know, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'd be pretty confident that the majority of traders' decisions are are robot traders. Brilliant.